This video is for students and mental health professionals alike who want to orient themselves to the changes to the DSM-5 that were just published in March of 2022. This presentation is not affiliated with or endorsed through the American Psychiatric Association, but it's my summary of some of the key changes that have happened based on directly from the source. It assumes a basic understanding of the DSM-5 and just focuses on the updates made. So if you want a more comprehensive overview of the DSM, I have another video that you can check out, but let's explore what's changed in the TR. If you weren't aware, TR stands for text revision. And can you believe it has been nine years since the DSM-5 came out, replacing the four? Well, now it is time for our beloved purple friend here to make way for the new TR and it's the updated fifth edition with the most current text updates based on the scientific literature and input from experts. It's important to note that this is not the DSM-6, it's more like 5.2 if you will and it's got the same overall purpose, it's got a lot of the same information, it's a manual that helps clinicians and researchers to define and classify mental disorders, which can help improve diagnosis, treatment, and research. So how did we get here? The APA has lots of fact sheets, which I used to create this presentation, but one of them gives detail about exactly how it was developed. But in short, the APA started work on the TR in spring of 2019, and it involved the work of over 200 subject matter experts, a lot of those people who were actually involved in the development of the original five. And they came from a lot of different diverse um, backgrounds and internationally recognized folks with uh, backgrounds in psychiatry, psychology, social work, woo -woo, um, pediatrics, neurology, nursing, epidemiology, anthropology, and the list goes on. And the whole process was overseen by a variety of task forces, steering committees, and subcommittees. So what did they come up with? Let me preface this by saying, don't shoot the messenger, okay? I know all the versions of the DSM have inspired vigorous discussions and lively debate, and I'm not here to analyze the merits or provide a critique, although there certainly is room for that but to describe what is and just summarize what we have. In a nutshell, if you don't have time for this whole video, you're in luck. I have a quick summary of everything I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail. So here are the highlights. There's a new disorder that's been add, added. It's called prolonged grief disorder. There are new ICD codes for suicidal behavior and suicidal self-injury. We're also now only using the ICD-10 instead of the 9. We've clarified criteria and includes updated information to capture the experiences and symptoms of children more precisely and other criteria changes that I'll talk about. And there's increased attention to culture, racism, and discrimination throughout. Let's talk about these in a little bit more detail, starting with our brand new disorder, prolonged grief disorder. Previously in the DSM-5, they included a category of persistent complex bereavement disorder as one of those conditions for further study. And it has now been promoted, if you will, to a real full disorder, and it lives in the trauma and stressor-related disorders category. And according to the APA, it is defined by, quote, a prolonged grief disorder with an intense yearning or longing for the deceased, often with intense sorrow and emotional pain, and preoccupation with thoughts or memories of the deceased. In children and adolescents, this preoccupation may focus on the circumstances of the death. If you're interested in this and want to dig in more, there's a fact sheet on APA and some other resources popping up to go into this in more detail in terms of what it is, how we came how not we, how they came to this decision and what it looks like. And I'm sure there'll be continued debate about it as well. Moving on to the ICD codes. So if you weren't aware, in October of 2015, the official coding system in the US moved to the ICD-10. That's the International Classification of Diseases. And in the DSM-5, both the ICD-9 and 10 were listed because when the DSM-5 was released, the, the ICD-9 was still in use in the US. 
now that we're coming out with the TR and the ICD-10 is well underway, they've moved just to those 10 codes. And additionally, there are new codes, two new codes, one for suicidal behavior and one for non-suicidal self-injury. There are also a large number of clarifications and updates to criteria and disorder descriptions. They made updates to the descriptive text for most disorders, over 70 of them, and also did some clarif clarification of modifications to criteria sets. I mentioned before, there are specific fact sheets on the APA website, and there's several listed here, but I'm just going to give you a few examples of the types of changes that were made. So for example, with autism spectrum disorder, Criterion A, which used to say, as manifested by the following, was revised to say, as manifested by all of the following, to improve intent and clarity of the wording. So there's these minor changes that actually can have a fairly big impact on how a diagnosis is given. Here's another example with gender dysphoria. The text of gender dysphoria was updated to use more culturally sensitive language, like desired gender was changed to experienced gender, and cross-sex medical procedure was updated to gender-affirming medical procedure. Another example is with delirium, and to clarify the meaning of criterion A, the parentheseed phrase reduced orientation to the environment was removed, and the second half was instead changed to accompanied by reduced awareness of the environment. So from an orientation to awareness. These might seem like minor, it's a one word difference, right? But it can really make a big impact. The other thing that is notable here is that they added more specific language for diagnostics relevant to children. So more precise criteria, especially for autism spectrum, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, PTSD, and per the new prolonged grief disorder. So here's an example. For PTSD, it says um, for children six and younger, they noted that witnessing does not include events that are witnessed only in electronic media, television, movies, or pictures. The next thing we have is increased attention to culture, racism, and discrimination. So one of the focuses in the development of the TR was reviewing the impact of racism and discrimination on the diagnosis and manifestations of mental disorders. And attention was paid to the risk of misdiagnosis when evaluating individuals who are from historically marginalized or socially oppressed groups. The APA has fact sheets on this as well, but I've summarized what I thought were some of the biggest changes in terms of language and approach. The term racialized um, is used instead of race or racial to highlight the socially constructed nature of race. Um, taking these bullets directly from the APA, so they, they get the credit for some of this um, wording and all that, but the term ethno-racial was used to denote the US census categories such as Hispanic, white, or African-American that combine ethnic and racialized identifiers. Um, let's see what else we have here. The terms minority and non-white were avoided because they describe social groups in relation to a racialized majority, and that tends to perpetuate social hierarchies. The emerging term Latinx is used in place of Latina or Latina to promote gender inclusive terminology. The term Caucasian is not used because it's based on obsolete and erroneous views about the geographic origin of a prototypical pan-European ethnicity. And prevalence data on specific ethno-racial groups were included when that existing research documented reliable estimates that were based on representative samples from those groups. They also included more information on variants and how symptoms are expressed depending on some of these factors related to culture and race. And similarly, talking about the ways that cultural norms affect how we perceive pathology in certain communities and cultures. 
Again, don't shoot the messenger here. I am merely relaying what was changed. And so love it or hate it, that's how it is in the TR right now. Then moving on to section three, that's that part at the very back of the DSM that talks about assessment, cultural context, and conditions for further study, which everyone's always very interested in. So it's emerging measures and models, basically, is what this section is. And they still have it in the TR. It's meant to offer tools and techniques to help clinicians enhance clinical practice, understand the cultural context of mental disorders, and facilitate further study of proposed emerging diagnoses. That was a quote from the APA as well. Some of the big changes in the TR, though, is that in those assessment measures, the checkboxes for male or female was removed um, to eliminate the use of binary classification. In terms of those clinician rated dimensions of psychosis and symptom severity measures, they basically edited those instructions to be in keeping with the criteria and severity specifiers for schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders, which were one of the big things that changed in this list of 70. So if you are uh, working in the field of psychosis um, and related disorders or want to, I would definitely check that out because there's some information about that. And then uh, the WHO's Disability uh, Assessment Schedule, the World Health Organization, um, they have clarifications about the instructions on uh, calculating summary scores for the WHO DAS 2.0, the 36 item full version. In terms of culture, I mentioned a few of those uh, that they've hit on previously, but in this spe section specifically, there are some key terms that highlight cultural context and how that context impacts how illnesses are experienced. And some of the concept of distress were revised to provide more clarifications and ensure that there was no stigmatizing or generalizing language. The cultural formulation section also presents an outline for a more systematic person-centered cultural assessment. There is a cultural concepts of distress section that goes into more detail about the ways that individuals will express, report, and interpret those experiences of illness and distress. And this includes examples like idioms or culturally normative explanations causes for certain syndromes. And there's another section here that I don't have listed on the slide. That's the alternative DSM-5 model for personality disorders. There's no changes in that. That one got to stay just as it is. And then we have the last section, which is conditions for further study. And as I mentioned previously, what used to be persistent complex bereavement disorder has now moved to the trauma and stressor related section as an official diagnosis that is now deemed prolonged grief disorder. Those are the changes to the DSM 5TR. I hope that you found this summary to be a helpful review. Here are some of my references and opportunities for further study and good luck.